living among us? One of the strangest stories to ever come from the UFO community is that of an extraterrestrial named Val Valiant Thor. Val Valiant Thor was supposedly a being from the planet Venus that looked exactly like a human. Val arrived on Earth on his ship with three others and worked with the government in the Pentagon for about three years. What makes this story so special is that there are a number of actual photos and sources verifying the existence of this event actually taking place. The initial story stems from Frank Strange's book, Stranger at the Pentagon, and is verified by the late whistleblower Phil Schneider, claiming the extraterrestrial Val worked with his father while in the military. Here is a clip of Phil Schneider giving details on Val Valiant Thor. This lecture was given right before Schneider's apparent suicide and they've been here helping us. In fact, I have a picture. I have a picture. Let me reach for it here. I have a picture of one of the aliens been working for the United States Pentagon for the last 58 years. His name is Val, Val Valiant Thor. He's right here. There's my father in the background. This whole place, the ready room of the USS Eldridge, Albilica, has probably explained or maybe even shown you this picture. There's a list of the, some of the notable people in it. And they're all the atomic bomb scientists of the day, regular day. This was, in, this was in August of 1943. Now, this guy has not changed one iota in 58 years. Uh, his brain capacity, 300 centimeters greater than ours. He has a thinking capacity, uh, IQ, if, if you were to measure it, be totally off the scale, be about a 1,200 IQ. Um, he speaks a hundred languages fluently, alien as well as others. Um, he's a remarkable person. I had a chance to meet him one time. Following are a few excerpts from Dr. Frank Strange's book, Stranger at the Pentagon, which might give us a few more details of this mysterious visitor and his mission on Earth. Dr. Frank Strange's writes, When I asked him where he was from, he replied, I am from the planet that is called Venus. I asked him how many visitors from Venus were presently on Earth, and he said, There are presently 77 of us walking among you in the United States. We are constantly coming and going. The First Meeting with the President March 16, 1957, in Alexandria, Virginia, one of the finest leaders of the planet Venus, operating under the direction of the Central Control and who had been chosen to make the contact as well as direct the project, landed his craft and was met by two police officers, weapons drawn. A thought transference quickly convinced them that he meant no harm, and he was ushered into the back seat of their patrol car. After crossing over into Washington, D.C., they were met by the Secretary of Defense along with six of his staff members, Soon police from every conceivable district and agency had joined in, all trying to claim their right to escort him to President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Through his own version of the power of positive thinking, he was able to dismiss them all and soon passed through the security posts followed by an Air Force captain. Meanwhile, his presence in the area had thrown everyone into a dilemma. The introduction he held from the High Council worried them because Though not written in any earthly language, their minds were given power to properly translate the inscribed message. Captain Gould, not his real name, asked him to remain, and after downing two plain bourbons, muttered, My God, why couldn't this have happened on my day off? Suddenly, the door opened and six armed guards led Val to what appeared to be an elevator. It went rapidly to the bottom-most level maximum security was in place. After transferring to an underground train, they sped toward the White House. Six officials, six armed guards, and three secret servicemen escorted him into the office of President Eisenhower. From behind the desk, the president rose while the secret servicemen remained nervous and uneasy. As he extended his hand to shake that of the president, the secret servicemen drew their revolvers and pointed them at Val. Following the nod of the president, they reluctantly lowered their guns. Standing in front of his desk, the president said, 
Of course, you know we have suspended all rules of protocol. I have a good feeling toward you. Please, sir, what is your name? And where do you come from? I come from the planet your Bible calls the morning and the evening star. Venus? Yes, sir. Can you prove this? The president asked. What do you constitute as proof? The president quickly retorted, I don't know. Will you come with me to my ship? The president answered with a quizzical look and said, My friend, I cannot come and go as I please. There are others to be considered. There are committees to be consulted and security measures to be adhered to. Please spend some time with us here. Let's get better acquainted, learn more about one another, and perhaps soon, real soon, well, we shall see. Richard Nixon At that moment, another gentleman rushed into the room. It turned out to be Vice President Richard Nixon. He appeared to vow to be very sharp, quick-witted, with fixed eyes and an amazing aptitude towards speed and proficiency. My name is Valiant he said as the vice president thrust his hand without hesitation. You have certainly caused a stir for an out-of-towner. The vice president smiled as he continued, Of course, we are not totally convinced of anything just yet, but suffice it to say we are checking and double-checking everything you say and do. When Sergeant Young from Alexandria radioed in and stated that you had just landed in a flying saucer, we thought, he continued, Sergeant Young had flipped. Say... Were you in on that UFO flap over Washington? You certainly had us all in a dither, if you were. After assuring them that this planet had been under close scrutiny for hundreds of years before the 1945 bomb blast, and with his special letter still in the slightly quivering hand of the president, he was requested to follow the Secret Service back the way they had come, to the Pentagon and into a beautifully furnished apartment where he would spend the next three years. Fortunately, he was prepared for such a lengthy visit and kept in constant communication with the starship. There were many occasions during which he teleported himself in and out of those quarters, often exercising trans-imagery to cause the security guards to visualize his face on a non-existent badge. Soon after his arrival, together with three members of his crew, he joined a convention in the backyard of the home of Mr. Howard Minger in Highbridge, New Jersey. The month was April 1957. A certain group of individuals who were interested in UFOs were meeting that day. Val and his crew members, Don, Jill, and Tanya, had changed into the same type of clothing worn by their Earth friends. The meeting was very interesting, and these people were on the right track. He was dismayed to learn the undignified manner in which these people were treated by the press. Nevertheless, these people were pursuing their beliefs, and this was good. A curious young photographer, August C. Roberts, snapped several pictures, thinking he was doing so without Val's knowledge. The photographer seemed to be greatly troubled when he attempted to talk to him. Yet, it was those very photographs which were to bring me together with this unusual man on that cold December day. Holding the message from the High Council in his hand, the President stated that Val's offer to help the human family would upset the economy of the United States and could plunge her into the abyss of chaos. In brief, he politely told Val that the people of this planet were not ready to cope with such conditions as would come into existence if the recommendations of this unearthly visitor were put into action. Nevertheless, he was invited to assist a number of scientists who were out working on medical projects directly associated with the space sciences. His allotted time to acquaint the leaders of the United States with his suggestions was limited to three years. During this time, he refused to advise them regarding a certain bomb in the sky, which we now know as the Star Wars system. In his apartment, provided by the Pentagon, he was able to maintain communications with his ship and was kept informed of the growing world tensions. His uniform underwent rigid tests from the government. By today's standards, they would now be obsolete. They attempted to penetrate the material with a diamond drill bit, but the diamond snapped under pressure. Acid rolled off the uniform and burned a hole in the floor. They fired a high-velocity rifle at the uniform, but it failed to pierce it. The report to the president read, Physical appearance, soft silver and gold lustrous. Fabric, 
unknown. Weight, 6 ounces. Total, including boots. Cut. Close fitting like a tunic. No cuffs, pockets, buttons, zippers, clips, or hooks. RXT2 tests. Indestructible. Finally, a bright-eyed colonel escorted him to a place where the final test would be performed. Val looked at the laser instrument amusingly. Upon command, the laser aimed a fine line of intense light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The colonel began his discourse that this device contained a crystal synthetic ruby in which atoms, when stimulated by focused light waves, amplify and concentrate these waves, then emit the beam. As the colonel continued to speak, his smile gave way to utter dismay, the ray being totally ineffective against the garment. He babbled on long after the laser had been turned off. He reiterated how powerful the U.S. had become since the splitting of the atom. He gave Val a lesson in atomic fusion. He went on to state that when a chain reaction of nuclear fission is set off by a neutron bombardment in the atoms, or a charge of plutonium or uranium isotope with an atomic weight of 235, U-235, an immense quantity of energy is suddenly released. The good colonel finally talked himself out, and Val was conducted back to his quarters along with his uniform. 1959 was fast drawing to a close. Chiefs of state were in a constant turmoil and confusion was the rule of the day. Indecision caused delay after delay. Economists and industrial giants conferred with politicians and military heads daily. The government leaders could not reconcile Val's being in a position to force their hand if he so desired. Several scientists attempted to learn the secrets of interstellar travel, without success. Christmas week was now upon us. I had been busily presenting a series of scientific lectures and speaking at a number of churches in Washington, D.C. Earlier that month, I had returned from Cuba, where I met personally with Fidel Castro. Unbeknownst to me, Val, working with Nancy Warren, formulated a plan whereby I would be contacted. Many Earth people live one life openly, while in their hearts and minds they live quite another. Double-mindedness seemed to be a way of life in the Pentagon building that served as the busy nerve center of our nation. Val once remarked to me that he had never witnessed in one central location such concentrated confusion. Nancy attended the lecture-slash-service which I conducted at the National Evangelistic Center, pastored by Dr. John Mears in Washington, D.C., Following the conclusion of my talk, she approached the platform and asked to speak to me. Strangely enough, the photographer in New Jersey had given Val's photographs to me, and I had been displaying them at my lectures ever since. I had no personal knowledge of them, other than what I had been told by the photographer. When she was unable to grab my attention while I was signing copies of my book, Saucerama, she showed her Pentagon ID, and that got my attention quickly, to say the least. We borrowed the pastor's study, and she asked me if I would like to meet the man in the photographs personally. Of course, I answered her, with a resounding yes. She then asked if I could follow instructions to the letter, to which I replied that I could, and she told me to meet her at the curb in front of my hotel at 8 a.m. the next morning. Nancy arrived precisely on time, and thus began the journey which at times would seem unreal, but which later would prove beyond doubt that there is truly life in God's universe. Those of you familiar with the Pentagon know that the normal traffic flow approaching it is to the right. We drove to the left. I knew then that something strange was going on. We had to stand in line to pass by a security guard. First one, then a second. Visualized an identification badge on my lapel. Something was making him see this. This utterly amazed me, and I felt that at any moment I would be picked up, handcuffed, and thrown into some jail somewhere. This, of course, was only my imagination and anticipation of what was about to take place. Nancy left me standing in front of a door which contained no markings. As the door opened, I walked in and stood on the threshold. My stocky form shifted from one foot to the other as I cleared my throat. The three men in the room were completely unaware of my presence and ignored me. I was puzzled, to say the least. 
Later, I would find out that Val had clouded their minds and rendered them oblivious to the entire session. They continued with their work. In walked a man, about six feet tall, perhaps 185 pounds, brown wavy hair, brown eyes. His complexion appeared normal and slightly tanned. As I approached him and he looked at me, it was as though he looked straight through me. With a warm smile and extending his hand, he greeted me by name. Hello, Frank. How are you? His genuineness astonished me, but quickly I understood. As I gripped his hand, I was somewhat surprised to feel the soft texture of his skin, like that of a baby spot with the strength of a man that silently testified to his power and intensity. His voice was very strong and mellow. It was filled with purpose and character. I again looked around the room to see whether the other men would say or do anything. They were still working, as if I weren't there. I noticed that he was wearing the same type of clothing as I. When I asked if he possessed any other clothing, he said that he had given several officials a garment so they could run tests on it. He then proceeded to a closet and produced a one-piece suit that glittered as the sun which streamed in through the window hit the fabric. I thought that it looked like liquid sunshine. I asked him about the material from which it was made. He answered, It is made of a material not of this earth. The general appearance of the suit was all but one piece, even down to the boots. It contained no buttons, zippers, or snaps. I asked him how it held together. He demonstrated by holding the front together and passing his hand over it as if to smooth it out. I could not even locate the opening. It was held together by an invisible force. He told me that his purpose in coming was to help mankind return to love. He spoke in positive terms, always with a smile on his face. He said that man was further away from love, which is God, more than ever before, but there was still a good chance if man looks in the right place. He told me he had been here nearly three years and would depart in just a few months. Claiming that he would not use force to speak with men in authority in America, he was happy to consult with them at their invitation. He further stated that thus far only a few men in Washington knew of his existence in the Pentagon, and few leaders had availed themselves of his advice during these past three years. He felt there was still so much to do, and yet his time of departure was getting near. When I asked him where he was from, he replied, I am from the planet that is called Venus. I asked him how many visitors from Venus were presently on Earth, and he said, there are presently 77 of us walking among you in the United States. We are constantly coming and going. During the next 30 minutes, he told me things about myself that even I did not know. Later, I was able to verify them with my parents and grandparents. He gave me information regarding the gravitational pull of Venus in comparison to Earth. I was informed that the abdominal muscles hold flesh firm against the mild gravitational pull, which is three-twentieths less than that of Earth. He gave me information which would be revealed to others over a period of years. Life on other planets and a plan for Earth? His reply was, There is life on many other planets of which people on Earth know nothing. There are more solar systems for which man has not even given the Creator credit for. I left that meeting astounded, greatly encouraged, and yet with a heavy heart not knowing what the future would hold. I began to wonder who would believe me if I ever told of this strange encounter with a man from another planet. I first considered not repeating this extraordinary story, but the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, the more I felt that it would bring a great blessing to those who would hear and read it. This interplanetary traveler possessed a wealth of knowledge, not only about science, but also about me. He stated that my book, Saucerama, could not have been written without heavenly guidance. Val's instructions were to leave Washington, D.C. no later than March 16, 1960. That meant that there were less than three months during which he could confer with scientists, politicians, military men, and the like. All missed his point entirely. 
They were all filled with self-ambition and cared little for the pressing needs of mankind. His efforts to bring about an end to the sickness and disease that plagued this planet were met with pathetic refusal. He was told over and over that his presence and his ideas were a threat to the political and economic structure. Certain religious leaders were also fearful of losing a grip on the people in the event that his presence was admitted on an official level. It was very disheartening that the administration failed to lay hold of such information that would change the course of human activities for the good because of economic reasons. Security regulations were very tight, but despite the fact that they knew he would come and go as he pleased, they delighted in playing their game. Val had vowed not to use force, and so another course of action would be necessary if the information which he had to relate were to be disseminated. This is the reason why he contacted men of honorable character and strength around the world. Many are presently working in close contact with Val and other members of his crew. His last meeting with the president did not reap any lasting results. He wanted to let the world know of Val's proposed plan, but the Secretary of Defense, the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and the military chiefs of staff were opposed to his suggestion. The president attempted to effect a joint meeting before the General Assembly of the United Nations, but this plan too was rejected. He was informed that the UN would receive a special press release in the form of a memorandum to the Secretary General no later than February 7, 1966. These leaders of the U.S. government argued long into the night, fearing that if the people of this nation learned of the plan Val was offering, they might choose to follow him instead of them. When a man feels that his personal peace and tranquility may be threatened, the human reaction is always that of swift self-preservation. At one point, the vice president insisted that the pressure boys allow the president to make the choice. He was vetoed without even a chance to complete his statements. World conditions were not growing any better. Much international pressure was being brought to bear upon the administration, they fought diligently and enforced rigid regulations with stiff penalties for revealing Val's presence. Even a major newscaster who inadvertently learned of his visit through one of his paid informants was silenced by none other than the Central Intelligence Agency, which has consistently disclaimed all knowledge concerning UFOs. Meanwhile, they maintained secret files that could actually prove the existence of intelligent life in the universe beyond all doubt. The morning of March 15, 1960, saw Val meeting with Nancy Warren, who would continue to work inside the Pentagon and be one of his contacts in the Washington, D.C. area. She would continue communication with others who would become part of his Earth contacts. There are still to this day many adversaries to human freedom. These parasites have embedded themselves in all phases of human society and will never be exposed except by extraterrestrial intervention. There are confused individuals who have perfected a saucer-type aircraft. Some of these are the result of an attempt by some to institute a master race. Remnants of this group still exist. These craft which they designed are still seen from time to time in areas of South America where some of those involved in the original plans still reside. These should not be confused with the spacecraft originating from other worlds or those coming from the interior of this planet. Nor should the occupants of craft originating from other worlds be confused with those evil messengers who do not originate from Earth but were cast into it after the first war ever recorded. They are in league with earthly low grades, who have condemned themselves because of their own choices. On March 16th, Val dematerialized and departed from this phase of his earthly mission. His next stop was the outskirts of Alexandria, Virginia, where his ship and his crew awaited his arrival, hidden by a wooded area. It was no problem for him to reassemble the atoms of his body inside his ship. As his craft rose slowly, a number of people stopped and pointed excitedly in his direction. Others stood motionless, transfixed by the sight which they beheld. He felt such a tremendous feeling of love for all of them. There was no panic in them, just curiosity and a strong desire to know more. 
Then, as the U.S. Air Force jets were scrambled, and with the force field now in full use, the planes darted past the ship unable to see them now. Even ground radar lost them on their equipment. Confusion once again reigned. On the way back to Victor One, he meditated on his home planet, the low, heavy, colorful clouds, the even temperatures, the perfectly diffused sunlight that made shadows almost non-existent, the lushness of the rich green grass surrounding his home. He was informed of several Earth people with whom he would maintain contact for a long time into the future. Strangely enough, those who knew of his presence, yet who claimed disbelief, were those who feared the most. Others figured they should have been the ones contacted, and not those who were. Upon returning to his home planet, he advised the Council of Central Control of the results of his Earth visit, including the failure of the leaders of the United States to take him up on his offer of advice and assistance to the human family. He was given the following instructions. To mingle with and become as Earth people. To work and labor in Earth enterprises. To help those who encounter possible threat or danger while striving for world peace. To give them advice and guidance. To entrust with superior knowledge those who have proven themselves divulge the essence of their mission to the collective national leaders of Earth only when the time is right. As of this writing, he continues with this mission, at the same time assisting in preventing our civilization from being the cause of orbital chaos by the destruction of our planet. This strange but true story is taken from excerpts from Frank Strange's book Stranger at the Pentagon. What do you think? Were we visited in 1957 by an alien from the planet Venus? Let us know in the comments below, and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to those who have, and thanks for listening to this strange but true story. I'm Steve White. Until next time.